the app. So we're going to be using a process called participatory design, which incorporates cooperative inquiry, and that is including children in the design process. So not only does it speak to what they want to know, it also will require them to ask their friends and their family how this app is working, and then just keep iterating on that process. So they have ownership of the design and the product. And it all ties in nicely with this Benjamin Franklin quote, which is, tell me and I forget, teach me and I may remember, involve me and I learn. So this is the community so far, like we had already said our thanks to everyone here, and also the green team is overseeing this project. We're also bringing in some more community members and the Native Plant Society. This is a quick timeline. We're establishing the garden now. We're gathering materials. Then come January, we're gonna design, test, and revise the app. And then come to the end of the school year, finally we will launch. We are reaching out for some grants and donations. Oops, sorry. <laughs> so we have applied for the HPE app. EF grant for funding of the sensors. We also need a rain barrel over on the side, the little wooded area. That's where we plan to have the garden. Our donors choose site is going really well. The idea is to make the garden more accessible for teachers by giving them grade level kits where that has the tools like magnifying glasses, binoculars, ID guides, so that you can just kind of one stop, take it, interact with the garden, and then come back in. We also got a great donation of native plants from Bowman's Hill Wildflower Preserve. It's of plants, over $500 worth of plants, and we are gonna plant them coming this weekend. We're partnering with Echo Schools, which, if you know, we already have at this school the Sustainable New Jersey badge. Now, Echo Schools is a little bit more kid-friendly and complements that program. So the kids will earn badges for the school as we go through, like, their biodiversity badge. Um, we can move on to a recycling badge. It just keeps stemming off of that. Already this past spring, uh, for Environmental Education Week, uh, Ms. Dolan got in the Echo Schools program leader and introduced the children to the program, and they got all excited about the cute little uh, butterfly badges and stuff. Then we did a biodiversity audit, and the children went outside and looked around at all the grounds and used critical thinking to figure out, are the grounds actually diverse? And like I had mentioned before, we are going to be doing the planting day, which everyone is welcome to come to this Sunday at noon. So in summary, fall 2017, garden prep, materials and donations, then we're going to do the design process, and then the spring plantings and launch the site. We already have our splash page up, which, thank you to Dr. Nicosa, is hosted right off of the STEM page and our donors choose site. And that's it. Thank you. If you have any questions. Thank you. Planting Day Sunday. Right? This Sunday? This Sunday is Planting Day, correct? Okay. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kusher, for helping with the projector. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. May I ask a question? Please. Question. Did you guys have a question first? I'm going to give you back the mic. Oh, yeah. That'd be great. Well, first of all, thank you for this work. This is really exciting. I'm someone who has a child at Bartle, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, you mentioned that there's an app and a physical garden. What is, what is the app? Is, is there an app or is, is the garden itself sort of a physical so app? If we want to talk strictly coding, it will not be a native app coded in Swift or anything. Okay. But what we do plan on doing is once the children design the interface, uh, I am going to connect it to the sensors that are outside that will be measuring temperature, oh, humidity, wow. light conditions, cool. and it will be a fully responsive site where through media queries I will make it so that the app, the phone experience, the mobile experience, I want it to be different than the um, desktop experience. So families can go and visit the garden using their 
their handhelds. That's fantastic. That I didn't understand. Okay. So you can go to the, the web page either on your computer or on the mobile and see information about the garden as it's as it's happening, perhaps? Or yes. as it happened recently? Yes, to make it that in interactive but also that data collection, connecting because uh, the environment and technology don't have to be two separate things. That's fantastic. That sounds yeah. really exciting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and another question about, maybe this is more for Dr. Taylor. Um, I'm a little unclear on how the GNT program is working at Bartle this year. Is this really just the GNT class that will be doing this? Or is this, I'd understood that Ms. Uh, Schaefer Dolan was going to be working with the whole school. Um, so like everybody was going to be doing the FUSE program. It was sort of GNT for everybody. We haven't launched our GNT program yet at Bartle because we're revamping it so right. that we could focus on kids' individual strengths. Right. I told the curriculum committee briefly that Ms. Dolan is um, creating an assessment that would allow kids to express their different um, interests. So, for instance, we're going like, to we'll likely be identifying students who have a specialty in performance mm -hmm. and then being able to give them enrichment outside of their regular class in that area. Kids who have an affinity for mathematics, those who are creative writers, as opposed to the traditional model, which has been you take an aptitude test, we uh, interview your teachers, you look at your grades, and if you score high academically, we'll pull you out and provide you additional enrichment. This new model is gonna focus on individual strengths, and I promise I'm gonna be sharing all the details with the curriculum committee in November, and Excellent. then Ms. Dolan has been invited to come speak in, at the second meeting in November. That's great, yeah, I think the board is probably gonna be interested in hearing about the program before it's finalized. And that's been sort of historically a, a program of great interest to the board, so just as a sort of <laughs> warning <laughs> on that note. Um, I also, I mean, I hope that will non-GNT students be working on the Citizen Garden? I, I have a student who is in GNT, or was last year, because he does score well on academic tests, and I've always felt that it wasn't fair that he got to do this like exciting, enriching stuff that wasn't available for the whole school. I mean, I'll just make a plug here, I know we're not having a discussion of it, for trying to find everybody's individual strengths and you know, bringing everybody into the Citizen Garden because it sounds wonderful, and frankly, my my son's friends that are not in the GNT program or were not in the old GNT program would love the enrichment that, that we're seeing here. I mean, I think this might bring some people back into engagement with school. Um, as it's currently planned, will there be non-GNT students involved in the Citizen Garden? It's not just going to be a small group of variously talented children. Sure, I'll speak to a little bit about that. Thank what you. Vicky was talking about was how the students in their science classes can go out and be part of the interactive garden I and see. contribute to the data collection. So we're trying to make these kits in a way so teachers can just grab the kit and go out there and collect the data. Citizen science is a really big field. There's a lot of great websites in which um, normal citizens can go and collect data and contribute to science. And so that's what we are hoping that as we can develop the curriculum more, add these components, so uh, any grade level teacher can pick up the sort of basket of stuff, go out there and have the students interact with the garden, but also contribute to the data on the back end. Oh, that's great. I didn't know that citizen science was a, was a thing, a term of art. That's, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So there'll be a whole school involvement here. Absolutely. What, what is the special, like limited to GNT involvement? What, what is that part of the program? Or is it building the website or? Yeah, maybe. Uh, yes, so the okay. core design team, as it's set up now, will be one of the GNT cycles. Okay. However, we do want to plan, part of the design process is testing the app. So we do want to involve all the grades, and we want to invite even families to come in, and we were trying to think about how to create like a family testing yeah. day. That'd be great. Because that's an incredibly important part of the design process to get that feedback you note all the bugs and right. then we you take it into account for your next iteration so that's how right. we imagined to include more than just a core small group in that particular process I see that sounds wonderful I mean you have a whole school full of beta testers right um, I do think that if we're revamping the GNT program to focus on other areas like performance there's no real rational reason to sort of say you high performing performers you artistic Ex, you know, you, you who excel in, in art, in vocal music, in whatever, you guys come and work on this app. And you know, here's some student who's not in GNT but who likes science. Yeah, it just seems like there's a little bit of a disconnect there. 
I, 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 there's no reason to say you, you're a great clarinet player, so you come over here and work on the app. You know, and this other person here who's not a great clarinet player and is not a GNT student, but really like science and coding. I, I hope that we'll consider making the entire thing as accessible as possible to people who are interested in it, not just the GNT students, particularly if our GNT program is going to reach out to students who might not like coding. I mean, if this is going to be a more diverse GNT class, who's to say they're going to enjoy coding? You know, I know plenty of kids who enjoy coding and they're not necessarily going to be. They don't play clarinet or score highly on tests. <laughs> okay, I just want to put in a plug Other for that. Questions? It sounds wonderful. I don't mean to be so challenging. I, more just about, I want to make sure that all the kids get a benefit from this, and it sounds like they will. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Well then, thank you for being here, and um, you're welcome to stay through the spotlight, or you can leave, we won't be offended. I want to thank the Barnell staff who's here. I'm thinking that you might have been here to support um, our student spotlight, or you're just here because you're here and you <laughs> love Barnell. Either way, or it was convenient, we're here in your school, right? So either way, Mr. Benjamin, you look beautiful. I love the suit. Come on up. You're all ready to go. Unfortunately, the student we want to spotlight couldn't be here tonight. Oh. But we want to talk about him publicly and then present it with a certificate. We did this once before. Um, Mr. <laughs> Benjamin and I took a picture in my office of a student. Mm -hmm. and perhaps someone could give him the time on the video. You could send the parents, you know, it's on the video at 7.59, or, you know, one hour and whatever. <laughs> I mean, really, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. So the family could see the video. Well, his teacher's here, so that's, oh, you know. Oh, Ms. that's all done. Ms. Ms. Dobrowski's here. That's so, all done. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to micromanage. Sorry about that. So, Hassan, hi. How are you out there in uh, HP land? Good evening, Dr. Taylor, members of the board and the community at large. Thanks for having these events, um, truly. And I love when they're here at Bartle because it gets to showcase all the great things that are happening here. Um, it also gets to showcase the best of who we are as a learning community. Um, quick proverb, because you know I never can start a, uh, anything without giving a wonderful, fabulous uh, uh, quote, if you will. A clear conscience is far more valuable than money. Unlike in business, here in education and even at home, we as educators and parents often don't get the chance to see the fruits of our labor or the product at the end of the day, month, or even the year. Countless hours toiling over lesson plans just to ensure a 20 to 40 minute lesson is executed to perfection, all to develop a child's capacity to learn perpetually. Kneeling down, smiling, conferencing, and offering words of encouragement five to 10 times a day to a child is what we hope will inspire that child to know and feel that they matter and can do more. Aristotle said, and I absolutely love this quote, pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work. Each day we as educators and as parents put in the work with no guarantee or certainty that our efforts will render smarter more curious, thoughtful, and caring children. But nonetheless, we engage this endless pursuit, just hoping and expecting to see our best selves and our teachings in our children. Tonight, I'm pleased to honor an individual, and although he's not here, an individual student who has enabled both his teachers, administrators, and parents the opportunity to smile with joy and glee as we are able to see the fruits of our labor and teachings in this student. Our student tonight is being recognized for his honesty, integrity, and righteousness. Several weeks ago, he stumbled upon a wallet while walking to school. In this wallet, he discovered over $140. Now imagine that. You're a fifth grader, you're 10 and 11 years old, and you have stumbled upon $140, go figure. When others might have said, hey, no one saw me pick up the wallet, dot, 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 this individual didn't think twice and immediately brought the wallet to the main office and gave it to Ms. Grassi so as to find the rightful owner. 
This student embodies a critical aspect of Bartle's vision of doing right by others. He is among an incredible student body who is committed to do right by others each and every day at Bartle. Please join me in celebrating and spotlighting Carol Doborowski's fifth grade student, Hassan Franklin. Hassan, thank you for being an upstanding citizen and making your mother, your teacher, your relatives, your principal, your superintendent, your board of education and community proud of your actions in doing the right thing. Hassan Franklin. Here to accept Hassan's award is his very wonderful teacher, Carol Doborowski. Give him another round of applause. Thank you, everyone. And thanks for coming out, Mr. Benjamin, the dean, everybody. I appreciate it. We'll make sure we get a picture tomorrow, um, certificate and all. So that concludes my report. Those of you who were here for my report, you're welcome to head out. If you're here to stay for the rest of the agenda, stick around. I did invite the uh, supervisors to be here through the curriculum portion of the agenda, and then I'm going to ask them to head out as well because they have a long day ahead of them tomorrow. Have a good night. And Vicki, thank you for being here. Thanks for being here, everyone. All right, where are we? All right, we're going to go on to the board committee's reports and recommendations. First up is curriculum. Michelle is not here, but I understand that she has passed the baton to you, Rob Roslovich. She did. Excellent. Right. Let's hear. Building on what we discussed last week, you know, again, we're... Is your mic on, Rob? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Is your mic on? It, it is on. I oh. was too far away. My ear is just... <laughs> yep. <laughs> Got it. No, it's, it's a good reminder when we're here. Thank you, sir. So building on what we discussed last week, uh, on field trip requests, there was one additional field trip that is added to the list at no cost, uh, where he would be uh, going back to one uh, incident report from June. Uh, in terms of curriculum, we have a lot of curriculum that we uh, – Hopefully a lot of us were able to look at, and there's a lot to uh, look at there in terms of curriculum. Number five is a new item, which was university and graduate students uh, who would be uh, interns or doing, uh, uh, what's it called? They'd be observing, most of them. Correct. Uh, and number six and seven, and I think all the way through ten were uh, training and related to uh, pulling some staff out for additional training, either related to Title I tutoring or handle with care training. Now, I know I uh, provided the board a lot of information to read regarding curriculum revision. I, I didn't expect everybody to read every single word. I did want the board to get a sense of the direction in which we now go with our curriculum documents, thanks to the work of Sackley, Dr. Nicosia. They're here in case you have any questions whatsoever about curriculum that's on this agenda for a uh, resolution to be approved. If you don't, it's quite all right. I'm sure they had things they, could, they did up until the board meeting, <laughs> but I just wanted to make sure they were available. Mr. Krieger? Yeah, I had, I had a, um, especially since I wasn't at the last meeting, I wanted to get a sense of how much was revision and how much was complete rewriting of these curriculum. Uh, I mean, there's boards of education that might be completely missing a curriculum in something. You know, it got lost or whatever. Um, that's not the case here. We have curriculums for these, for these areas. Were they completely revised from scratch? Or were they, or rewritten from scratch? Or were they revised? And what sense could you give us on, on what was done in, in that way. Sure. For the um, the STEM curriculum that was written, uh, we had a new one, Makerspace. So that's a brand new curriculum ah, okay. to replace the technology at the middle school, six through eight. So that was a brand new curriculum. Um, all the other science that was revised um, was the revisions from when I picked up with my work last summer. 
Uh, some revisions needed to be done based on best practices in creating performance task assessments and opportunities, learning opportunities to really meet the science and engineering practices um, within the curriculum. And then fifth grade mathematics was pretty much a brand new curriculum. When I started uh, in looking at the documents, they were pretty much about 109 to 120 pages of a program that the school adopted many years ago called Everyday Math. That is a program, it's not necessarily curriculum, so um, we wanted to make sure we created withstanding curriculum regardless of programming so that we were meeting the, the New Jersey student learning standards and the needs of all students in the classroom. And then that was a resource that we were able to pull from. If you read the document, you'll see examples of where everyday math was applicable, the, the learning opportunities mm -hmm. that were in the program. So that was a relatively new document as well. What do you do, what do, you do in cases that interest me a lot? Um, AP computer science, AP physics. Um, how, do you, how do you do that? I mean, is that taken from the, the textbook slash curriculum we're, that we've adopted, that we're going to use? Um, is it taken based on who's going to teach it, working on it? How do you do something like that? Because that's a difficult problem, especially in computer science and physics, both of them changing so much. So those are usually revised from what the um, AP board brings down, so the teachers go to their AP summer courses, and right. then from there they get the learning opportunities, the standards, the assessments from the program, from the AP board, and then we use that to uh, create our curriculum. Got it. So that's more driven by the AP regulation board rather than more locally. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Scott? Uh, Yeah, it's just conferring really quickly. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, we have we have um, curriculum writers here. So thank you again, Ms. Fatfinick, for writing curriculum and working on things throughout. Um, so I, um, your question for ELA looks a little different. So we have a writer's workshop that's been in use and is part of the writing curriculum, mm -hmm. but this is the first year that K through th uh, third grade has access to reader's workshop resources, which of course is Dr. Taylor's vision and the entire vision of the district to really do the workshop model in K-5 classrooms. So we had a total revise, total rewrite, and definitely from scratch for fourth and fifth grade because they designed lessons to have close reading involved using noted forms of um, the information being portrayed so kids can access it from many different points. And there's options for teachers to use it in small group or reteach, so I would say that there's some revolutionary ideas even though it's a revision, so. One of the things Thank I hope you. you noticed when you uh, looked at the curriculum guides is that they all include much more extensive modification charts than we've yeah. had in the past. And that is a, mostly a result of the strategic planning focus area, too, that has this differentiating instruction. So um, that's one of the things I'm most proud of, the work that you did with the teachers. Any other questions? Yeah, could um, Dr. Nicosia review a little bit more about the Makerspace, since that's a uh, new program, if you don't mind, some highlights? Oh, my, yes, I, it's one of my favorite topics. It's, uh, <laughs> so far, it's been going really, really well. We're actually able to score some money through a Title IV uh, grant to outfit uh, the program with little bits and makey-makey circuit kits. Uh, but the idea is students will be solving real-world problems, um, one for each uh, grade level as they go through a quarter. So for example, the students in seventh grade will be um, requiring to be uh, demonstrating that they're good digitally literate citizens. So they have to educate others on how to be a good digitally, digitally literate citizen. So the idea is they're learning about um, those uh, 8.1 and 8.2 technology standards, but through a real world scenario. And they have basically any platform, any means by which they want to solve the problem, communicate the problem. So the traditional um, technology um, standards that were addressed previously are still in the curriculum, but in a more innovative way through a problem-based learning approach. So they still have to articulate their solution. So that could be through a Google presentation or a PowerPoint or through a Word document if they're writing a letter or making a video. So they have an opportunity for a green screen and do video production. Um, 
So they have all these opportunities in how they want to solve their problems. In addition, uh, the course starts out every day, starts off with um, a quick fire challenge. Uh, so students get to pick their quick fire challenge. So they do the uh, solo cup challenges. They have to um, engineer a um, holder to bring a ball down a six foot slant at the best time and stuff like that. So they're doing these sort of engineering and kind of design challenges as a way to get their brains thinking, co working collaboratively and thinking um, like in the STEM, the STEM world to be able to then engage in um, their makerspace uh, curriculum. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. Can I ask, um, and I don't know, this, is, uh, this isn't necessarily on one side or the other, but um, if we were to go into a classroom or a, a grade and just uh, have a sense of from one um, section to the next to the next, how much difference would we see from classroom A, B, or C in terms of um, the strengths that each individual teacher may be able to provide as opposed to kind of the same exact curriculum, one room to the next to the next. Do you know what I mean? Is that a... That's a great question. And I, do you have an answer? Because you're looking like you do, and exactly if you want to chime in, you're welcome to, but you don't have to. Okay. So curriculum was revised um, and created in a way so that a teacher could, when they were doing their lesson plans, sort of use data to inform their instruction. So like Ms. Ackley was saying, there's a lot of opportunities for differentiated instruction within the curriculum. So the hope is that students, the teachers realize, okay, here's my group of students that I have um, as learners, and then I'm going to go to the curriculum and pull out what I need to in order to meet their needs. So if I have students that need enrichment in a certain topic, I can go to the curriculum document and find those activities, those learning opportunities to meet those students' needs. Same thing if they have um, uh, some struggling learners in their classroom, how can they go and find the um, learning opportunities that will meet those students' needs. So that's one thing that we're really most proud about with the curriculum that we're presenting to you for approval is that although it may look slightly different in every classroom. It's still pulling from the same set of resources. So what you should see if you go into a classroom is truly differentiated instruction. So it's not a program in which all teachers at 853 are doing one particular thing. It's that they're doing what's best for their students, culminating from that. And we like to say the curriculum is a living document because even um, to just last week or a couple weeks ago, the fifth grade teachers went for more Conquer Math training and they opened up their Google Doc and they started typing in another color some more strategies to meet the needs of learners within that document. So it's a living document that we're still adding more resources to to help meet the needs of all the learners. Do you want to add anything? The one thing I would add for ELA, like I said, thanks to your support and all of your help, we were able to add resources. So the curriculum unifies the objectives within the reader's workshop and within the writer's workshop. So everyone across fifth grade needs to know how to start looking closely at nonfiction tasks text and answering, asking tough questions and analyzing author's bias. But then the resources I use for my English language learners and for my um, inclusive students with IEPs, those are all available through the text sets and the teachers make those decisions, decisions and choices as to implementation. So you're going to have variances in what it looks like within the classroom, but yet the same objectives, if that helps, and the same, this for reading, um, the strategies, the core of what each child will be able to do at the end of that grade level stays the same because of, of what's happening in the reader's workshop, if that makes sense. So they're growing each year, and like I said, there's a great progression and now consistency that way. One other very quick question. Are we still teaching To Kill a Mockingbird? <laughs> He's referring to the latest news story on the censorship of To Kill a Mockingbird, right? Are we? I think in Mississippi we are, aren't we? Is it one of our texts? 10th grade. Microphone? It was 10th it was grade. We read it in 10th grade. I know my ninth grade. I just finished reading Catcher reading in the Rye. Yeah. They, they just finished Catcher in the Rye, and they have um, the color purple coming up. So they have awesome things coming their way. And also, the Joy Luck Club happens in ninth grade. They'll be reading that soon. So like I said, culturally responsive text. School community <laughs> took offense to the use of a 
uh, uh, expletive to refer to uh, African Americans and To Kill a Mockingbird. So they censored the book, which is what I think Mr. Magazine is referring to. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm still curious about the text sets and how rigid those text sets are question. within the classroom. I'm going to bring Ms. Ackley back. Here, I'm going to give you the mic. I don't know if an exemplar was already given to you as a Google Doc link, but I'll, I'll do that. Um, so I, I think you should be able to, within the curriculum document, be able to open, open each hyperlink. But for example, I set the, um, the goal of having for the high school teachers and for middle school teachers as well as having text sets in at least two out of the four units. Mr. McCray did a brilliant job with the curriculum writing. He has a text set for every unit he's teaching, which is outstanding. So. Um, it's not rigid, it is a living document, just as it is for math and science. So as they're finding more resources, they're continually adding to it as well. But it's really up to the students in their classroom to determine how they're using the materials. For example, um, News ELA is an, an excellent resource and you change the Lexile level, so the readability for kids can vary from um, helping a student with an IEP to challenging a student who's um, part of like enrichment and gifted and talented. So I, I have you know, multiple resources available just even from that one website, which is awesome. Uh, so, and it's also available in Spanish and other languages. So okay, there's so, great things. So when it, when it lists Romeo and Juliet it, within the ELA for, I think that's uh, seventh grade, mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily mean that every student would be reading Romeo and Juliet. They might be reading a, a variation on it. There are two different versions of that one available okay. from our current cr collection. And also there's um, supplemental support for Romeo and Juliet that the teacher has. Yeah. Okay, Great question. Thank Great question. Thank you, Ms. Ackley. Did you have a question, Ms. Gowan? Um, I have a, a sort of a silly technical question. Um, do we have, is this really the AP physics curriculum that we have? It says, uh, when you open it up, it says, uh, uh, applied physics grades 9 through 12. I, I just wonder if maybe the board has the wrong document. This is not really a question for you. Yeah. It's, it looks like we might have the wrong document. But, but that's not for you. That's for Dr. Taylor. So, okay. It's, I'm not sure. It's, it's different oh. from the other physics curriculum, but it doesn't really look like AP. So, I don't know. I could hover over your shoulder and I could sit down and we could take a look together. I mean, it's, you know. I'm sure there's a wonderful AP physics curriculum. I just haven't had a chance to look at it. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, one, one more, Scott. Please. Uh, can someone please describe exactly again what is service-based learning and how that applies, where, it, where that is? I can in a nutshell, but if you want, uh, it's an extension of the Be the Change program in sixth grade. It's an elective, but Ms. Ackley? Um, so Nikki Faringo is currently teaching that class and they're doing awesome research about what the community needs are and how students could actively be part of helping a community concern. It's also linked to Rutgers. So the students, the, the goal is that after the students do the research in the classroom um, through until about April that they'll go to Rutgers and present their projects and presentation and the work that they've done. So it's really, it's a beginning um, action research. It's really awesome. But it continues the efforts to be the change. Oh, okay. If that makes sense, yes. Thank you. Yes. It's part of our effort to expand elective options at the middle school, which we never had before, before uh, last year. No, but it looks know, really exciting. For, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, it, it, if, if Be the Change had been on the first page, I, I probably would have been right there and understood exactly what it was about. But when it, reading it in service-based learning, it, it all seemed to make sense, but just it, putting it in the didn't have in the framework of right. be the change it, it <laughs> makes a lot more sense to me now it looks great it looks like a much more intensive version of be the change where you actually learn how to you learn in more detail how to ask interview questions how to write letters how to identify people that you want to talk to it looks fantastic in my inexpert opinion well, if there are no other questions or comments I am going to send dr. Ac uh, dr. Ackley I've just given you a doctorate uh, dr. Nikosia and Ms. Ackley oh, I'm sorry. I, oh, oh. I one of our student reps. I, it's about the personal health and fitness, uh, or the personal fitness class, so I don't know if either of you actually is like particularly expert in this area or whatever, but because students aren't actually coming in for that class, or as my understanding, um, many students in that class aren't coming in, how does the curriculum affect It's an elective for the first period students who come. Right, okay. So it's only offered to those students who elect to come first period. So, okay, so all the students who have been exempt from it who are technically enrolled? Like, there's, well, 
Okay, my understanding is that there's ath th uh, three sport athletes who are enrolled in personal fitness and don't. Is that a different class? Uh, okay, so I'll, well, I think I can answer your question by explaining what's going on with that in general. So um, students who are involved in an organized sport or could be dancers or do something that's physical fitness related mm -hmm. can be exempt from PE in general, not just that course, but PE as well as long as they qualify by going through a process we call option two. Okay. So later in the agenda, you'll see that we're approving, I'm recommending the approval of some teachers, uh, I think Ms. Shimon in particular, to supervise option two. So this first period is, really doesn't have anything to do with the exempted students, it's just an additional elective for kids who love personal wellness. Yeah, I just, I guess I'm confused because in just in terms of like the vernacular at the high school, we refer to the people who are three sport athletes as kind of being in this, but they're actually option two. Is that, that's correct? Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. Uh, okay. Have a good night, um, supervisors. Thanks for being here. And um, I think that's it well, for curriculum at least. Okay, great. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, we will now move on to finance and facilities. Mark, are you ready for us? And for people watching, of course, this is our voting meeting, so we have discussed all of most of this stuff last week. I was not present, but I assume we discussed. Well, I, I actually wasn't present either, oh, and, and, but you don't know, I guess. Because I wasn't um, present. And, and Rob, you, you worked, went through these. Um, so there are a few new ones, numbers 12, 13, 14, and 15. Uh, re Treasurer's report, board secretary's report, board of ed certifications, and approval of budget transfers are all new. There's two new people uh, being approved as contractors in number 16. And I think that is all. But there's nothing, uh, Rob, do you have anything to add? There's nothing uh, very unusual in these. No, there were, there were some items that we were discussing in, uh, in, in our um, finance meeting that were related to uh, some changes uh, necessitating additional uh, staffing, that kind of thing. Uh, but in terms of you know, what we're seeing on, on this week's agenda, it's really stuff that we discussed last week. Okay. Are so we'll be hearing are, about the... Are oh. these the new backboards that we were talking about? They were donated. Are they new? They look new. Yeah, they look new. <laughs> yep, there they are. Uh -huh. Beautiful. They're pretty nice. So I, I expect we'll be hearing about these staffing changes. Oh, I do have a question the about the uh, motion. Um, so mo on the finance, I am the recipient of, of the travel approval in number nine. Should I not be moving that? Linda? You can move it, but you need to abstain. Each board member who is uh, mentioned on a motion right. needs to abstain from that particular item. Right, so I need to abstain on 9, and when, Rob when you, needs yeah, when to, you to abstain on, motion. on 11. When we do it. Yes, 11. when you provide your uh, vote that you would abstain on those items. Okay, yeah. thank you. Are there any questions for the Finance Committee? And are there any additional curriculum questions? I neglected to ask that general question. Okay. Okay, we will move on to, which one have we not done? Ah, personnel, is that next? Yes, personnel and communications. Judy. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to um, read in the uh, new things on the agenda from last week and a couple of corrections on the agenda. Um, so number eight, um, we have the resignation of the Supervisor of Curriculum and Instruction, um, Suzanne Ackley. Um, that will be uh, making her last day in the district November 27th, and I would like to on behalf of the board, thank, you, thank her for her work on uh, behalf of the curriculum. Um, as you can see from her presentation tonight, she did a lot of good work, so um, thank her for that. Um, and then we have number 11 on the Schedule B positions. We have an add-in for um, uh, wrestling, um, Evan Roger Farmer. Let's see. 
We have a, a little bit of a change in number 17, approval of disability leave of absence. Um, the estimated date of return um, for this employee is November 4th, which was formerly October 6th. And, okay. Um, number 23, we have some additional academic coaches. That would be Mr. Broadfoot and uh, Mr. McCray in the high school. And I think also an add in is under uh, number 24, the approval of the high school Title I academic coach, Nicole Krupski. And, oh, we have a correction, I think, on number 30. Uh, no, it's, I think it says. <coughs> is on there. Oh, okay. No. Yes, okay, so the uh, the payment is incorrect. So it should be, um, for Venice Road, the um, the hourly rate should be $22.21, not $17.29. Thank you, Ann. Um, on 32, we have the approval of middle school Title I after school teachers listed. Cheryl Gloff, um, Christine Sakura. Rebecca um, Unans has a new name, which is Allie. So Rebecca Allie, um, Sarah Kozlowski, Mark Lobianco, Joyce Puccio, and Margaret Claslo. Um, number 33 are also <laughs> the approval of more middle school Title I homework teachers. Number 34 is the approval of high school uh, Title I tutoring teachers. Number 35 is the approval of Mr. Uh, Esteban as a Title I translator as needed. 36 is the approval of, of uh, medical leave coverage at Irving School. Um, for, let's see, I, uh, let's see, oh, for my, uh, um, that's listed. And then we have um, some volunteers for the drama uh, department um, at the high school listed uh, four volunteers thank you to them and then number 38 we have an, um, a request to um, approve an administrative leave for um, a teacher employer employee rather and that's it okay wonderful um, we'll move on to policies and regulations um, I'll start with number two actually I've we went over this last week, or you probably went over this last week. Number two, we've been over a couple times, it's the uh, special education receiving schools policy, which is mandated, and it's, the essence of it is mandated, and you know, I don't think, I think all of us are comfortable with what it says, <laughs> mostly tracks the statute. Policies for first reading, these are the ones that we went over at at least one workshop meeting. Um, I think I'm gonna ask that we table uh, number one, Subparagraph I, 8550, Outstanding Food Service Charges. Well, I, I was going to ask you if you'd rather just, since we have to have a second reading, keep it and then oh, okay. review the change into the next board meeting? Perfect. Okay. okay. Well, actually, you know what? I have how it is on my drive. In, on the publicly available copy, is it the version that the committee approved, or is it the version with Linda's The version version? is The version that you would approve for first read does not include the change. Okay. So we'll consider that uh, as time goes for on. For the second reading. Yes. Right. Okay. All right. So there'll be no tabling. <laughs> okay. I'm going to recommend that we uh, approve all of those for first reading. With 8550, Linda apprised Scott of a, a state statute that says once um, you give that, you know, someone is in arrears on their, on their school lunch, uh, the parents are given one notice and then they're given 10 days. I, I don't remember the specifics. And then after the 10 days, they get a second notice, and then I don't remember again the number of days, but it's something like 14 days, eight days. After that, the student is not given lunch if the parent is not paid. So the state statute, which I also looked up, it does say, you know, after that time period, you know, no lunch shall be provided. So I wanted to, um, whereas, whereas we had changed the policy to not uh, bar the student from receiving lunch, 
um, we were hopeful that the board and the, the uh, administration and the parents could work that out without an impact on the child. Um, so we, we're going to need to revisit that okay. and see if we can. I know, I know. And see if, if, if we can do anything to protect the student without running afoul of state law. Right. For now, I'm recommending it with that, in the form the committee approved, which does not have the no lunch provision. Okay. But, this, but, the, but the suggestions that came to us um, had checkbox choices. Yes. And one of those checkbox choices, I thought, was to allow us to continue to give lunch to the child. Was that in contravention with state law? There was a part of it that we checked off the, the more liberal, yeah, more yeah. student protective version. Right. But even that version said that after the 8 plus 14 oh, days or 10 plus 13 days or whatever it is, no lunch. And that tracks the language of the statute. Now, it's possible that that statute does not bar us from providing more protection, but I'm a little confused about how to resolve that. So I'm asking us just to pass it as it appears in the public documents for first reading, and then we'll try to work that out. And, and we could ask our attorney. Yes, we could ask our attorney. Yes, that is a good idea. That would be the way we, to go. We should. We, in fact, that if would be the way to resolve to, this. Uh, if we're allowed to be more liberal in the states than right. the statute. And hand out sandwiches. I mean, hand out sandwiches, right. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think know, it's we reasonable. have our normal legal remedies against the parents if we decide to pursue them. Right. I don't involve withholding lunch from a student. Yeah, I, I think it's reasonable to go with Scott's recommendation to, to at least approve it on first reading. Yes. And yes. While we consider the, uh, the, the significance of that, those few items. Because overall, I thought it was, it, it was in line with what we were steering towards. Right. But, right. you know, I, I think we just need to clear up just a few issues. And I appreciate, Linda, you uh, apprising us of that. Yeah. <laughs> We can't just make whatever changes we want necessarily well, in the statute. What I, I, what I um, pointed out to Dr. Taylor was that as it stands right now, it's a bit of a contradiction because it, it says in the policy that you, know, you would adhere to the law, referencing the, the statute, <laughs> but the statute is contradictory of the policy writing as it stands right now. So that Correct. is the problem. We don't always know what language tracks the statute and what language is put in there by stress estimate, and so Linda uh, advised us <laughs> of that. So we're going to um, take a look at that. I imagine we may wind up, you know, just putting that language back in, but we'll, you know, maybe we can ask Jonathan, ask our attorney, see what we can do. Something. So, I mean, I really don't, my personal view, anybody who cares to hear it, <laughs> is that, you know, if we want to pursue the parent, you know, for an illegal action or whatever, go ahead. The lunch is not very expensive. And it's a kid, and you know, there's clearly something going wrong in that home if they really cannot get their act together to pay their lunch money. Um, okay, so let's see. Uh, that's policy. Uh, equity and excellence. Sharice went home in the middle of executive session. She was sick, um, so she hasn't assigned this to anybody else. Scott, do you know if there's been a committee meeting? There has not. There was not. There has not. Oh, you guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot who was on the committee. All right, so uh, I guess we're. Oh, public comment. Let's see. I have to find the little script so I don't say anything wrong. Hmm? Yeah, no, I'm just looking for it. <laughs> Sorry. Page three. Page three. Oh. One, two, wait, page three? Uh, I, I definitely know that the board has reserved this time for your comments. Um, oh, here it is. Oh, number 12, I see. Sorry. Ah, how about that? The Highland Park Board of Education welcomes public participation and has reserved this time for your comments. Board policies 164 and 167 establish and regulate the right of the public to participate in public meetings. So if anybody would like to come up to the podium, write their name and address or name and affiliation, that would be great. Come on, guys. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Okay. Nothing at this time. There will be another public comment session later in the meeting, <laughs> should anyone uh, want to revisit that. All right, so I think it comes time. It's time to vote. And we will start with curriculum. Rob Orslevich, would you like to move the curriculum items plus whatever edits, if any? I would like to move items 1 through 10 with one change on item number uh, 8. It reads Rebecca Anangst, and that should be Rebecca Ailey. Under item eight, but I'd be moving items one through ten. What was the change under eight? I'm sorry, I just didn't hear you. The she echoey. The oh, she is oh, the oh, name changed. The last name. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, I want to make a comment about the curriculum. I mean, the, the AP Physics curriculum. I don't understand, but 
Do, is it, do I vote yes on it because I trust our teachers? I mean, how, what, when we vote on this, what does that mean? That we have read every line of it and we agree with it? Anybody have any I insights on that? I, I didn't, I didn't, I hope not. I didn't, when I was looking at these, I didn't realize that we had an AP computer science or an it's, AP physics. It's brand new, the AP computer science. Is that what, science. okay, so yes. I didn't realize we had them and then during the meeting I noticed them and then, um, and when you were commenting on it, I was actually reading it, okay. the AP physics. Yeah. Um, well, the committee has gone through all this. Oh, the committee has gone through. Okay. They, they, these, Michelle and Rob. And okay. They, they ah. seem, they seem to be Bruce. pretty reasonable courses, yes. I would as say. As do our teachers. Yes. Just for, you know, just anecdotally oh, well, for those. The existence of the courses, definitely. And no, I mean the curriculum. The curriculum, too. The yeah. curriculum that the course will follow seems to be uh, very consistent with a college level class. I didn't, un I didn't understand the AP physics curriculum. It seemed like it might have been another document, but you know what? No, you know what? Good. I am just going to trust our committee and, the committee, the committee, and our teachers no, and our no, administrators. No, 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 okay. So we have a motion from Rob. Do we have a second? Second. Wonderful. Linda, may we have a roll call, please? Could we have a roll call, please? Ms. Beyer? So I am abstaining from two, and I'm voting yes for the rest of them. Ms. Gowan? I'm abstaining from two because I, I missed the last meeting at which more information was provided. Uh, and yes on the others? Mr. Krieger? Y yes. Mr. Magaziner? Yes. Ms. Pietrobono? Yes. Mr. Rosalitz? Yes. Okay. Moving on to finance and facilities. Mark, would you like yes. to move the finance? Yeah, items? I'd like to move numbers one through 24. Is there a second? Second. Okay. May we ha can we have a roll call, please? Ms. Beyer? Yes. Ms. Gowan? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Um, yes on 1 through 8, yes on 10 through 24, and abstain on 9. Mr. Magaziner? Yes on everything but 11, abstain from number 11. Ms. Pietrobono? Yes. Mr. Rosalitz? Yes. Okay, personnel and communication? Um, I would like to move items 1 through 38 with the um, changes that I read in. We have a second. Is there a second? Second. Can we have a roll call, please? Ms. Beyer? Yes. <clears throat> Ms. Gowan? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Mr. Magaziner? Yes, for everything but uh, number 14, and I'll abstain from 14. Ms. Pietrobono? Yes. Mr. Rosowitz? Yes. Okay, policy and regulations. I'd like to move that we uh, pass the listed policies in number one for first reading and the policy listed in number two for second reading. We have a second? Second. Can we have a roll call, please? Ms. Beyer? Yes. Ms. Gowan? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Mr. Magaziner? Yes. Ms. Pietrobono? Yes. Mr. Rosowitz? No on 1H. Yes on the remainder. Okay. We have no equity items. Uh, now usually we move on to our board liaison reports. Did you guys cover this last week? Did you go through the liaisons? It was not on the we agenda last week. It was not on the agenda last week. Okay. I should know that, obviously. All right. Municipal Drug and Alcohol Alliance. Does Mr. Joshua Chen give you a report of what happened if there's a meeting? For the Municipal Alliance? Yeah. The drug and no, alcohol. that doesn't happen until November 14th. Got it. The last meeting was September. Okay. Uh, public information is Michelle, who was not able to be here. Same with Highland Park Television. Uh, Mr. Magaziner, Highland Park Educational Foundation, any report? Well, I attended the meeting. It was mostly a reorganization meeting. There are a couple of additional members, which is good to see. Um, but uh, nothing too, I shouldn't say too significant, but nothing of public interest to report. I will say uh, to the board, um, my notes show that the next meeting, the October meeting, is the, 14, is, is the 24th. And so I'm not going to be available. So if anyone would like to attend uh, in my stead, that, that is available. That, that meeting is in the superintendent's um, office. 
Would you mind sending out an email to remind those of us who are not? I shall. And those of us who might not take notes accurately. All right. Um, Commission for Universal Access, was there anything, Judy? Um, I was not able to attend, but I reached out to um, the chair of the committee, and um, she wanted to say, hold on, um, that the commission is very happy um, to about how much help Ms. Uh, Boudin and Dr. Taylor have been um, helping make CPAC stronger, and when I asked her what you had been doing, <laughs> um, she said that you were helping uh, provide childcare and line up speakers and um, agreed to let CPAC give an award at the end of the year to a teacher and a para, um, and you were giving professional development to teachers and paras that attend workshops so they can get um, to have more. So she wanted to give a shout out to the administration. Wonderful. Do we have a report on the public library meeting from Ms. Ackley? That meeting is Monday night, a week from today. Okay. Actually, can I do a little library shout oh, yes. out we from a library um, uh, mention from Judy? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I think at her last meeting um, that Suzanne went, there was a, a reference to um, something that's coming up on the November 7th ballot. Um, it's called the New Jersey Library Construction Bond Act. And as an administrator at a library, I can't tell anyone how to vote, but I wanted to provide everybody with just a little bit of information. Um, and basically what this, if it passes, um, the Bond Act would provide, the state would provide monies for construction and renovation projects throughout the state of New Jersey. And it, it's a one-on-one -on -one match of state and local dollars. So if, say, the Highland Park Library or the Highland Park town wanted to have the library do a project, they could apply for matching funds. So that's coming up on the ballot. So I'm just going to give an information sheet to everybody so we have uh, a uh, group of informed voters here. So if the town wanted assistance in paying for the leaky roof at our library, yes. then perhaps this ballot measure might help them by getting Correct. extra funds from the yes. state. And so if anybody we, is thinking about whether to vote, yes. We haven't had anything like this on the agenda on the, um, on the ballot for a long time. You might remember a few years back when they did the same thing for um, state universities, and there was a lot more construction with that. So it's the same idea, but this is actually a one-to-one -one match. So, um, As an always underfunded yes. public school system, I, you know, I'm not sure that Judy so, yeah. is allowed to advocate for a particular position since she's a professional librarian. Um, but certainly as a, Look it over as and, a perpetually uh, <laughs> underfunded school system, we encourage people to vote yes on this because we need all the outside the school resources that we can yes. get yeah. Yeah, to support our teachers, strong put our library, ELL. Strong community, help Strong library, strong community. <laughs> all those things. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Shared services. That's Darcy. Do you also deal with shared services? Do you also go to the shared services meetings? Or is that no, that, that committee has not gotten off the ground. I, I didn't think so. Okay. <laughs> Ruth, CPAC? So, um, just to um, piggyback what Judy was saying, the first CPAC official formal meeting of the year is tomorrow night at Highland Park Middle School, and it's a workshop, Strategies for Reducing Challenging Behavior. So they have a speaker coming in, and um, there is babysitting, but at this point it is too late to uh, sign up for that. Hopefully people who needed it signed up last night by 6 o'clock. Um, but that is tomorrow at 7, so I am planning on it, ongoing. So. That sounds great. I'd like to go, too. I, um, I don't know if this is the appropriate time, but since I'm the acting president, I'm going to just make time for it um, <laughs> by fiat. I, I would encourage the administration to really consider changing or altering the uh, method of getting notices out to people. Um, I mean, I don't remember getting a CPAC notice. Um, I imagine it might have been one of 10 PDFs that I received in an email and then either said I would open later or tried to open and then my phone crashed. Um, I would really like to see us move toward a system where we at least have in plain text the basic information. CPAC meeting Tuesday night, 6 o'clock, must apply for daycare by, childcare by whatever date. Because I, I know from speaking with the parents in my circle that PDFs are hard to open on slow phones. It's maybe different on an iPhone, but if you have a cheap Android phone, they, it takes a long time. If you don't have a PC at home, you're relying on that, you know, blah, blah, blah. I, I, I agree, even though I have a souped up iPhone. Uh, I know, I, I know. <laughs> I still can recognize the problem. Right. So I'm going to have the administrators, when I meet with them tomorrow, look to do that. The only exception would be if there's a 
PDF that is graphic intensive that we can't copy into a text. But if it's just simply text, we can do it definitely. Right, and I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't do the graphic ones, but if there's a basic message in the graphic ones, like CPAC meeting 7 o'clock Friday, then that could be, you know, see PDF for many additional details even. I think that would be really helpful. I, I mean, I just know people aren't reading them. And uh, when I give my report, which I actually will now, jump ahead, if that would be, a, I think it would be a jump ahead. Um, oh, you're not finished. Are you finished with the CPAC? Yeah. Okay, I didn't mean to. So actually, I can go ahead and give my report on human relations. And one thing human relations was disappointed about was that um, the Human Re Relations Commission was the attendance at the September 11th day of discussion, which of course is not run by the school. But I, I would guess that the school possibly tried to help and sent out a notice or two. Um, I know I didn't receive one from the school. Um, my guess is possibly it was a PDF saying, please read all these PDFs, and then I, I didn't. I got busy and didn't go back to it. Um, so I, you know, I'm glad that the school is considering that. I certainly don't mean like, let's get rid of PDFs, but if we could just get a little nugget of information there in the email itself. Okay, um, so actually I think I'm not skipping ahead because Sharice is not here. Yeah, then human relations. Um, that was the main school relevant uh, thing at the last Human Relations Commission meeting. They're planning for Martin Luther King Day, which will that be, uh, wait a minute. What, month is it? Okay, but <laughs> I forget what month we are in now. Um, will we be uh, hosting the Martin Luther King Day celebration as we usually do? Uh, can you repeat that? I'm the, having I'm a hard sorry. time yeah, to I, echo. So, actually, the Martin Luther King Day celebration, will that be in the high school as it frequently is? It, yes. The, the yes. town. Uh, okay, great. Yep. So watch for announcements on that. Um, let's see. Next is Board of Health. Um, Board of Health great. meeting is this Thursday. Wonderful. Green team, Mr. Ruslevich, has there been a meeting? Uh, on the green team, I don't have any update at this time. Wonderful. Uh, Darcy not here. Uh, how about your uh, position as delegate to the Middlesex County School Boards, Mr. Ruslevich? The next session <laughs> is November 1st. It's at Pierre's in South Brunswick. It's a, related to school finance. I went to last year's session, so if someone else is interested in going to it, uh, but otherwise I might just go to it and see if I don't glean a little bit more information from it this time uh, that I might have missed after going through the whole negotiation session and having three years in as, as a school board member. I can't believe they're having it at Pierre's. It's supposed to be a delegate a, a school board meeting, or is it just sort of a, a, a professional development for school board members? It's a professional development for school board ah, members, so there's a, there's a little bit of time to like uh, talk to other e school board members from different districts and kind of get a sense of where they come from and what their uh, biggest uh, hurdles are, you know, and have an yes. informal sort of discussion with them. And then the uh, floor is turned over to someone who's an expert in the field and they'll discuss uh, the particular topic for that evening. And uh, this next one is school finance. Wonderful, okay. Um, I actually don't know anything about Middlesex County School Boards. Could I ask as a matter of sort of academic interest, the risk of boring people? The Middlesex County School Board is elected members or appointed members? We don't elect them, do we? I, I, I forget how it's I, structured. I've never seen them on the ballot, I don't think. So do they, are there meetings at which you have a vote as there are with the NJSBA? Delegate Assembly, and which is a private organization, I realize. Right. This is usually when I turn it over to Darcy. Yeah, we'll yeah. For Darcy. <laughs> That's we'll check back in. Yeah. Right. Darcy. We will stop interrogating yeah, Rob yeah, yeah. on the other side of the I table. have no <laughs> idea, Rob, so obviously I don't expect anyone else to know either. All right. The President's report. The President is not here. Um, old business board goals. So it's only 8.53. Oh. <laughs> you know, I wonder if we should... How would you guys feel if I move that we move the board goals to the very end of the meeting? How would people feel about that? And we, see, we get to it if we have enough time after other items? Would that be okay if we, rather than start on a potentially lengthy discussion right this second? Sure. Okay. Sounds good. Is it, can we move the board goals to the very end of the, I guess we want to have public comment on the goals, huh? All right, well, let me just go, let me go ahead to old business letter B, approval of submission of the CUSAC report. Um, did you guys go over the CUSAC report at the last meeting? I did. Okay, so everybody's. It was okay. in the uh, board drive, the so board you had a chance to see it. Okay, so in other words, we don't need to have a presentation on it because we had one already when I was not here. I do have another old business item, which I oh, didn't list. Absolutely, go ahead. Because it's just data that happened to come to me okay. recently. Um, the latest re-registration information. Ah. Uh, oh, yeah. 
I'm very pleased to report that we've gotten our numbers down to a very manageable amount. Um, as of Friday, um, we only have 11 families yet to re-register at Bartle, 32 at the middle school, that's down from 44, 12 at the high school, and four students who live out of, uh, I'm sorry, live here in the community, but we sent to out of district schools. So uh, if you total that up, we're talking 16, uh, about 59 students, families left. We'll be sending certified letters home to those families to follow up and make sure that we get the re-registration documentation. This does, though, transition to a new business item I wanted to bring up and I didn't put on the agenda. Can I do that now? Or are we done with all business? Uh, should we go ahead and move? Uh, do we need, to have, we need to have a motion on the QSAC report. Is that correct? Correct. Why don't yeah. I go ahead and move that? Okay. I'd, I'd like to move that we uh, adopt, that we accept the recommendation of the superintendent to affirm the accuracy of the QSAC report and affirm that we're going to affirm and affirm the... I guess we're going to vote to approve the QSAC report and to direct Scott to submit it to the appropriate organization. <laughs> um, so I move that that happens. May I have a second? Second. May we have a roll call, please? Ms. Byer? Yes. Ms. Gowan? Yes. Mr. Krieger? Yes. Mr. Magaziner? Yes. Ms. Pietrobono? Yes. Mr. Roslowitz? Yes. Okay, so why don't we go into old business re-registration and then after that, we'll uh, discuss discussing the board goals. Take it away, Scott. Okay. Um, it came to um, our director of uh, special services attention that um, one of our families, um, of a uh, child who we do send out of district, may not be residing in Highland Park. We've been investigating the matter for over a month, and we had to defer it to our board attorney because it's, uh, it's a delicate situation. Our board attorney is recommending that we hire a private investigator to help research the matter of residency. He's only looking at this one particular case. I happen to have two other questionable residency cases that I had been thoroughly investigating for at least a month that I would, I would also recommend we have a private investigator research. Um, this is a common practice. I know in my last district, it was common in Union County. We hired a private investigator. That individual um, assessed a fee of something like $80 a case. Um, it does involve taking photos of the, the home the, the, in question that, we, that is a supposed residence in Highland Park. Um, in the case of Kenilworth, it actually amounted to um, finding a, a family that was truly not residing in, um, in the community. Um, the parent appealed to the board, lost the appeal, went to the commissioner, lost the appeal, the family ended up moving to Florida. Uh, I did a research the uh, districts in our county to, to see what they're doing. Of all but two use private investigators. Sayerville, Sayerville and Metuchen don't use private PIs. Uh, I didn't ask why. I recognize this is a sensitive issue. It could be delicate um, for some on the board who have concerns about sending a private investigator out into the streets. However, um, because we are, because this is being recommended by our board attorney, our council, and this is a situation that could potentially um, cost the district if we do not follow up thoroughly, uh, at least $100,000 on average on ballparking with transportation and tuition costs per year. The child is very young, so we could be looking at a 15 to 18 year outlay of this annual uh, tuition and transportation assessment. So I wanted to have a, a, an open discussion about the board's feelings regarding the use of a private investigator. Ultimately, I have to make a recommendation to the board to hire somebody and, of course, to pay for his or her services. So I do need board approval before I move forward. Personally, I don't see it as a sensitive issue at all as long as we have gone through every uh, step that we need to go through. So that whatever that protocol normally would be, whether it be phone calls, uh, emails, uh, registered mail, I know we talked about that, 
which to me is a small cost in comparison to the overall. So to me, once you go through all of that, go through the procedures that we normally do, and then still have the, these questions, at that point, to me, it's, it's not a sensitive issue at, at all, and I, I would approve for it, of it. So by way of example, in this case, the following steps were taken. First, we did send a letter home, didn't receive. Actually, the letter came right back to us, which is what piqued our curiosity. What would it say on the letter? Did it say uh, no forwarding address available? Or? We ask that you provide documentation. No, I'm sorry, what did, the, what did the post office stamp on it? Out of curiosity. Uh, it, it was a return, res um, that's a good question, actually. I don't know. I know it came back to us. I okay. find out. Yeah. Uh, then we sent another letter, certified return receipt. <coughs> that came back to us. Finally, we called the individual, the family in this case. Um, they, they claim that, in fact, that address is where they're residing, requested that we send another letter, which we did. This was over a month ago, 30 days from the last Friday. So, I'm sorry, last Thursday was the 30th day. Prior to that, we sent a third uh, communication to the home requesting um, documentation, uh, telling the family they had 30 days to provide the documentation. When we didn't get it, on the, the day after the 30th day, our counsel drafted a letter, which was a little firmer. Again, it sent a return receipt certified. We did not get it, we, we, it was acknowledged or received. And at this point, we still have not received any documentation. And I, I can't divulge, I, I would prefer not divulge details, but I have other information that leads me and Ms. Budai to believe that in fact, this family does not reside in uh, Highland Park. It, it's a, it's a, a, a good comment on the, on the state of our education in Highland Park that people want to send their children here badly enough to um, perhaps to be sending them from other districts. Well, this student is going out of district. Yes, and, this is an out of district student. Well, no, student. I know, but they're, there may living, be another reason they're they... living somewhere else in the state, but they feel as though perhaps that it's, that we do such a good it. job of of placing the child in the right in oh, the right that's in right. the right school, which the district that they reside in isn't going to do, that they're very happy to use our taxpayers' money. Which I'm sure that's I'm sure the that's second the second thing I want to say, which is a little I agree with Rob completely, but a little <laughs> yes. more strongly, um, that they're stealing from us. Right. They're stealing yeah. from us. They're taking everyone's tax money. It's not right. Allegedly. And, Allegedly, <laughs> Allegedly, if they're doing, anyone who does this, <laughs> and, and, and furthermore, um, Scott passed over uh, an article to me, which wasn't special ed, it was just a family in another district, it was in NJ.com, in another district, who um, yeah, sent okay. some of their kids to the school they used to live in, the district, it was, they liked the district so much, not ours, you know, a different district. And when they lost, the administrative law judge ordered them to pay $39,000 in, in, in fees to that school district. They are taking our money. It's not, if they're doing such a thing, it's not right. And we should do whatever it takes, um, you know, within reason, within common practice, um, to, to determine where they really live and, and have them send their ch children to the appropriate school district. So I'm all in favor of your suggestion and our attorney's suggestion. I mean, our attorney doesn't, uh, is, I, I have no doubt that it's perfectly legal to do this. You know, I, that our attorney gave us wise counsel in that regard. I mean, this is something that I feel a bit uncomfortable with. It's hard to sort of verbalize exactly why. I think if they, if we're wrong, having a PI outside their house snapping photos, you know, it's pretty unwelcoming thing to do if we're wrong, and perhaps there's no chance we are. But Anne, if, if we're wrong, it, it would only be because we have not gotten a, the response from the family that I we know. have sought, and which every, every other family has given us. I know, I know. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting we look at every re re family right. that didn't re-register and send a yeah, private no. investigator. I'm only talking about the, the, very most, the most egregious of cases in which I recognizing the board's concern right, right. and the issue of privacy and whatnot have compelled me to just expend the money, to invest the money in, in looking and doing this. Right. 
Um, did this come up as a result of re-registration? In other words, did this information, did, did this, the motivation for sending out the PI, is this simply because this family did not re-register and as, I mean, did re-registration help us learn this information, in other words? Uh, the, it, the, answer, the answer to your first question is no. This is not a direct result of the re-registration re process okay. at all. Okay, I just wanted to see how much re-registration is. No, I have three us. cases um, that okay. I'm looking at. The one um, that the council advised us to hire a private investigator right. for is, to me, almost like a slam dunk. Um, almost a, what? Other, a slam dunk. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, to, to the extent at which the attorney is advising us to go this next route. Um, the other cases, one involves uh, uh, somebody who was homeless, but now we believe is, has acquired permanent residency in another community. Mm -hmm. And the third case, I'm sorry, just those two cases. Okay. Right now. Um, moving first to the homeless case. I mean, we have a homeless liaison. That's Didi Deacher, is that correct? Absolutely. And I, I assume, I, I mean, I don't want to micromanage the district. You know, that, that's your job. However, as a board, we need to be concerned with the pop possible public reaction to, you know, I, I imagine we'll wind up doing this, but I just want to make sure we've like really, uh, you know, rung it through the ringer or whatever. Um, Absolutely. Has our homeless, I mean, sometimes when you have a homeless family, there are serious problems in that family. They have issues about communicating. I mean, my clients, many of them are homeless. They're not good about returning phone calls or sending in certified letters. Have we had, for example, someone in our district go out to Ac the new residence? Actually, Dee Dee Deacher goes out. I see. She, so she pays no home visits. Um, we had a situation in which she did that in New Brunswick. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. We, uh, there was a family living in a shelter in New Brunswick, but it happens to be a shelter that also offers permanent residency. And so she had to go as far as not only visiting the shelter, but inquiring about the status of this particular family's placement at the shelter. Is this she the family you're talking about? Or trail. Is this the family you're talking about? Or is this no, a different, this, this is, a different is actually case. Other case. A, a separate issue, but okay. one of which I Actually, one in which we were able to resolve without having to go through a lot of hoops. Right. So in other words, we know where this family is living right now, the second family. Okay, so why do we need a PI? I mean, what's that? What's the, in the first case? I, I'm actually just moving to the homeless family first, the previously homeless family first. We don't need to hire a PI in that case because we have uh, No, 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 knowledge. we're not going to hire a private investigator. Oh, okay. oh okay. well, actually... Because um, you had mentioned maybe doing it in some other cases. We do have a situation, I should say. I'm not sure if I want to go the route of hiring a private investigator, but we do have a situation in which a student was listed as homeless, but now we believe has permanent residency in another town, quite a distance from here. Mm -hmm. We paid home visits. To the other but town? we have not been able to reach anybody. Nobody has responded to our request for communication. So you mean, I mean, again, I don't mean to micromanage, but you paid a home visit to her home in the other town and knocked on the door and nobody answered? Yeah, absolutely. We have actually paid a home visit. Nobody's responded to our... How do box. we know she's there if we, we, do, we have other evidence of some I, sort? I can, I'll bring Dee Dee Deacher here and have her testify before you. Well, no, I, 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 oh, I don't mean I'm like, don't trust somebody. I'm just asking, I'm just trying to understand intellectually, sort of. So, we somehow know that she lives there, but... When we knock on the door, nobody comes in, nobody comes out. We have some reason to think that they're there, however. Why do we think they're there? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not understanding your question. So we're thinking, I'm like, sorry. say, this person lives in Westfield. How do we know that? Like, what, what's our evidence? And I don't mean details, but has okay. Didi seen oh, them there? Oh, I see. I'm Did sorry. she go to the apartment and see someone come out? So when we believe we have a place of permanent residence, we do try to contact the family and whoever's living there. In this particular case, in which I'm referring, the, the two parents are separated. I, I really don't feel that comfortable no, sharing no, no, too many I, details, I, no, but I, I'll say no. that without telling you which parent is right. absent in the relationship. Right, someone's absent. The other parent has already made contact to indicate that I that see. parent is living in a particular residence. But when we tried to confirm, we didn't get a response, personal response. Wow, it seems like uh, a we are paying transportation for the student, by right, the sure. way. Oh, no, no, right. I mean, I have no doubt that we need to, like, get this settled, right? Um, I, I'm not suggesting we hire a private investigator in that case. Oh, okay, okay, that's However, all it's an example of some of, these, some of the borderline cases. Some of the borderline right. cases. I, I just want to say, I understand what you're saying, Anne, and I appreciate you bringing that up also. I, 
I don't want to see a direct link between our re-registration process and then, you know, having private investigators going out to, <laughs> to investigate everything that we can. But um, that's the last time we have anybody re-register, right? Right, exactly. Now, I appreciate what Rob said, of course. and I agree with him. I want to know that we are following, that we have procedures and protocol, and that they are being followed every single time and documented, and that this is a final step. You know, especially, and I think, you know, the cases that stand out to me are the ones like where we're sending someone out of district for $80,000. And it could be millions of dollars. So I, right. I think it would be helpful then to um, assure the board, for good reason, um, th that we are going through all the steps we have to, is if I come to the board in November with a recommendation to approve compensation for a private investigator to conduct a, a search, I also provide you, redacting names of course and any other confidential information, all the paperwork that we, that okay. prefaced the use of a private investigator. Well, I, would, I would like to, to, I'd like to just comment that I wonder if the board has a policy on this or whether we should update our policy on this. Oh. Because if the policy... <laughs> really? It, well, I'm sorry, but no, no. If we, I, I just, Scott of course, wouldn't yeah. have to. Scott wouldn't have to come in to make this case right. if the policy said we'll do A and B, the district, we'll do A, B, C, and D, and in those cases where all those steps didn't work, the superintendent is authorized to hire private investigators to ascertain where the family lives. Right. What we don't want that to have, be easy. have happen is uh, somehow we would be accused of being selective in one way or another of going after certain people as opposed to others. That would be inappropriate. Well, and that is what we will be doing because, of course, we don't want to send a PI after everybody. Maybe we should send a PI after everybody. I mean, we're selecting a special needs student who is costing the district a great deal of money. We're not doing it with the other 50 families. Right. So, I mean, how I understand the motivation for doing that. Is that okay no, for us to do? Actually, we're not. We're, not. We're, we're actually going after people who did not follow, who did not respond to us. Well, no, there's 50 families that haven't responded to us. This is the one we're thinking about hiring a PI for, because this one is costing us money, extra money. Right. So if you're worried about selectiveness, we are being selective. Well, let's go after the other 47 then. And then we, won't be, then we can't be accused of that, because that would, perhaps that would be the right way to, to this go. Family, this family, though. Fine with that. This family. Because we might find some others. We might, and we should be careful too if this family is any kind of a protected class, you know, if that could be perceived as selective in a way that's not helpful to us, you know. I think this family rose to Scott's attention before the re-registration yes. problems. So it isn't the case that they were costing us. Um, and in fact, of the 50 families, I believe Scott had said that four of those families were of uh, parents of special needs students who are going out of district who we haven't gone to that step yet because only because we're slightly behind in schedule um, and you know slightly behind the schedule of having kind of ascertained that that family doesn't live in town or believing they don't live in town so that when we catch up to the 50 and maybe we have five families that Oh, and five families that should be uh, investigated one way or another because they just never get back to us. Right. Some of them may or may not be special needs. And, and any family who's sending their children here who don't belong here, um, they're liable for tuition. Of course the they are. The case in uh, NJ.com, uh, right. they would charge like they had to pay back nine tuition. or twelve or twenty thousand a year for the kids that were in school and should have been in another school district. So, I think the money, well, of course the money counts. The money isn't the issue. It's the, it's kind of the. I, I hate to put it this way because it doesn't sound right when you're hiring investigators. But it's kind of the moral high ground. Somebody is, is uh, taking money from our district, from our kids, when they live somewhere else. And we, we kind of can't let that happen. I asked, okay. we, we have a history of, in, of attracting out-of-town kids who do pay tuition yes. in this town. And we've had that for a long, long time. It's onesie, twosie. It may not be, you know, 20 or 30, but we do have that. So to those people who That's are spending point. 10, 12, whatever, mm -hmm. $1,000, how would we sound if we're saying, well, you pay it, but 
it's okay. We're not going to go after the others. I, I mean, for my part, I would say that, of course, all those things are true. I have, and I don't think any of us dispute that if people are doing this intentionally, as they must be in some cases if they're doing it, um, if they're doing it, it's theft. If they're doing it, we need to stop it because our taxpayers can't be paying for this. Our special needs students you know, have needs and resources that they need. Um, I think the only question in my mind is about the method of tracking people down. I have no issue with the principle that this is a moral violation, it's a legal violation, and it's our responsibility as a board to be fiscally responsible and make sure that our taxpayers aren't paying for somebody who lives in Edison. Um, my only concern is with how we do it. I mean, I think you raise a good point, Rob Magaziner. If, do we want to be selective? I mean, right now we're thinking about being selective because we don't like the idea of sending a PI after 50 people. And I'm not sure that, I mean, Scott, is it your intention to go through this process with all 50 families and when it gets to this point, then send a PI out? In other words, are we, are we just not there yet with the other yeah. 49 families? Well, as I stated a few minutes ago, no. Okay, um, that's the... In fact, it would be, wouldn't be cost effective would be too costly. I don't know if we could incur that kind of cost, nor 80, is it necessary. If it's 80 bucks, then we could. But Scott, but Scott, if, if, if you get to the 50 families and you send each of the 50 families a certified letter, right. and 25 come back with correct information, so we're down to 25, and you send another certified return mm -hmm. receipt letter to those 25, and 12 of them come back, they finally get to it, and you're left with 13. And after 10 times, you can't get to those 13 families. I would certainly, as a board member, be in favor of investigating them, because otherwise you can't kick them out. I'll tell you what makes the few cases I referred to earlier distinct. We heard things about these families. We, we have additional information, aside from the I formal see. paperwork, that leads us to believe these things. People talk in town. Um, and frankly, I would, if, if, if I'm down to 15, 20 families who haven't re-registered, I'd try to look into it further in-house, um, talk to friends, talk to peers, hey, so-and-so okay, and we want to make sure that they're, they're you know, they're, they're um, I don't know, I don't know how I would pose that well, delicately, again, that but is, I would try that, to find out. That is yes. part of the protocol, yeah. and, and probably is, is a good reason why we should have formal Yes, policy. I think you're right. Yeah, absolutely. So, by the way, the policy we have on record, which is um, 5111, eligibility of resident, non-resident students, which was last at uh, update, uh, revives March 2011, has a lot of language in it, but it refers to the code, NJAC6A, um, when it's out referring to the process in which we would engage. And so then I went to that code uh, while we were chatting, and it's very lengthy. You can do the research on your own if you go to Strauss Esme. Uh, but so there's not clear language that states what we would do refers to the code. Right, and probably it's up to us to do the specifics. My guess is the code does. Well, the code is very specific about what to do when someone doesn't pay for lunch. The code goes into, you know, it really micromanages us how many days the kid gets, and, you know, geez. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, we'll figure out how specific the code is, and it sounds like it's not okay. terribly specific. And I think you're right, we do need a policy because we don't want to appear to be going after. I mean, I don't know, do we think it's enough to not be accused of selectiveness that we have extra evidence about these families? I mean, we really need a policy. But, well, the read right now, though, we've, we've sent them two requests for information. We've had non-response on both of those. Right now, we have not given them written notices, as far as I understand, that, we, that, we, that they haven't established res residency. We're just requesting residency information. So my understanding is that the, a PI would be the formulation for us to have something to start with this go, you know, we, are, we, we don't feel that you've established residency. And then that would start the clock as to whether or not they want to go, oh no, here's my stuff, and prove that they are a resident, or show that they can't prove it, and then, they, and then work towards moving their child out of district, correct? Yeah, what's the process from here? Yeah, so what, what's the process after the PI? Because I know we have to write them a written letter saying that we So what if two things could happen? Um, uh, what a private investigator would do is give me a report, give me pictures, and the summary based on the pictures would tell me whether or not the person is in fact a resident. If the person, if the family is not a resident, we would serve them notice that they have to remove their child. They would have, I think, 21 days according to our, um, our we do have a policy on removing students who are uh, residents. Um, 
but the, but the family could very well decide they're going to now establish residency in Highland Park, in which case we would be obligated to, to, to keep them here in Highland Park. Simple as that. We could pursue them for the period of time when they weren't residents, but that, yeah, that would be a uh, well, little bit difficult litigation-wise. <laughs> there's always that potential. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty I expensive. Mean, like I said, though, in the case that I, I dealt with in Kettleworth, it was the only residency case that went as far as the commissioner. The family just got tired of all the hassle, couldn't afford to make the move to the community, and so they uprooted and moved to a completely different state. <laughs> Meanwhile, the protocol that we're following now is that Scott, uh, as the superintendent, is coming to the board and asking for our approval to go in this certain direction. And I think, I mean, I, that if that's what you're asking, then I, I would be all for it as long as we're as long as we've gone through all of those steps. But we're, you're not asking for us to vote on that. At this oh no time. no no! Just but I don't want to do something before I get a vibe okay. or a pulse on the board's feelings. But I'm well, sorry. Go ahead. Um, I mean, I, I your your concern with selectivity is a good one, and it. So we're not voting tonight. I mean, will you be putting this on the agenda prior to hiring the PI? Or no, I mean, this this? Is, there's a time of the essence here. So you need to do this right away and then retroactively. Our, have our, our attorney's yeah. recommending we do this as soon as possible. Right. So, I mean, maybe we should make a decision about the direction we want to go with regard to the other families. Do we want to make this a policy that applies to everybody after, like, you know, 17 letters have gone out plus two phone calls plus a home visit or whatever, then we hire the PI? I mean, we don't have a policy in place, but... Do we want to demand that of Scott, that we make sure the same protocol is followed for all of these families, not just for the ones that we have special information about or that are particularly expensive? It's interesting because it, on the other hand, if we, if we really do know, yeah, we, we regardless of, 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 of letters, if we actually have information, know that a family does not live here, we then know. Why are I, mean, you I, I don't know that you need to necessarily go through the 15 letter process. No, I think you have to do that because if well, you're going do you? to say that they need to well, it's, be it's taken sort of, out of the school. It's right. kind of gossip at this point. I mean, I would right. imagine, I mean, I would imagine we don't have a photograph of them like, you know, buying their new house, putting the key in the door, you know, in Edison or wherever they are. Well, somebody um, else lives there. Well, I mean, depending on what the information is, maybe somebody else lives there, maybe a relative lives there, and we're not really sure. I mean, no, not maybe, if somebody. Yes, if yeah, somebody else lives there. Really. But, I, but I understand, of, yes, that would be an yeah. example of we know. Right. Right. Yeah. right. There, right. Are, there could be an example yeah. of we know. Yes. I'd still, still like to the see details. the protocol followed. Yeah, uh, I mean, <laughs> still, is it their grandmother that lives there? No, no. it's not. I mean, it might be in some of these cases. <laughs> well, no, I'm saying that because... I'm not saying the case... Yes, I'm, I agree. There could be that case. Yes, we might actually have that case before us. Be there could be any case. I mean, you right. can imagine all sorts of things. Right. Well, that's why, I mean, that's why I'm thinking that maybe we should go through the protocol anyway, because we might think we know... But does Scott need a vote tonight? He doesn't need a vote tonight. very unusual for us to do. He needs a retroactive. As opposed to a recommendation that he should follow the same protocol for everyone... And when that protocol gets us to the point where they're not responding and we need to get the, we need to get real evidence as opposed to they're not responding, that he takes the appropriate measures, which he's suggesting an investigator. Right. And, and he is the CEO. What? And he is the CEO of the No, of no, the, right. The but the thing is, it's so going to be on the agenda to vote on it in a couple of weeks, I to vote on whether we paid that money for the investigator. Right, and he right. wants to do that first. So we right. need to decide if we're going to vote yes now, because if we're not going to vote yes now, Correct. it's going we're to be like a really awkward thing. We're not going to have an emergency meeting of like, an $80 investigator right. bill. And, you know, my yeah. guess is that it's not going to be $80 if he has to sit out there for hours getting photos. Yeah, yeah. Especially if the person doesn't live there now, but they're going to take a picture of some grandma walking in the building. No, and no, like, they'll take a picture of where they do live. Well, that's right. That's not what Scott said, but that is, yes. If we know, if there is a case in which we know where they do live, then yes, that, that would <laughs> be one way, way to do it. This could be the... Uh, As someone who works with investigators, though, this could be more than $80. Um, right. right. My so I just, I don't want us to get to the meeting and be like, no, we're voting no on this. You know, and Scott already spent the money. You know, that would really stink. So um, do we want to give a recommendation to Scott now that we go through a standard protocol for all of these people, when we don't get the response, when we do this, we do that, we do that, then it's time to ask the board for money for a PI. I mean, does that sound reasonable to people? It that does. we go through yeah. a regular it protocol? Yes. yes. Okay, yeah. so we're not gonna be singling out the family with the most expensive special ed child? Absolutely, Absolutely not. Okay, okay. Well, only any, any egregious case 
at only after which we've exhausted all the protocols would I go that next route. Okay. And then I would present the information in closed session um, because it would contain confidential information. Right. right. And then you would see a recommendation on the board agenda to compensate so and so for services. And the reason we're talking about it now is because that recommendation might come after you've already done it because Correct. time is of the essence. Correct. Okay. So, I mean, we have a consensus that we should recommend informally for now without a vote that we would like Scott to go through the same process for all the families and, you know, sort of do the same things regardless of how uh, expensive that child's education is. And we'll come up with a formal policy later. But, okay. All right. So we're not going to just pick and choose among right. the, right. the students who are costing us the most money. Yep. All right. I hate the idea of a PI. Is there anything else we can do informally to, like, reach out to these people? Is I can anything? get out there if you'd like. I'm not a private investigator, but I get up early. I run. I could run, and, uh, you know, my runs. I mean, so. I could go out there, you know. I mean, just like... <laughs> just happen to be taking a selfie. <laughs> I know, exactly. I, I, I mean, I, just, it's not really a joking matter, but I no, guess what I'm, I'm trying matter. to Is make there... light of a very serious situation. No, it's awful. It's awful. It's awful for us, and it's, you know, it's awful for this kid, too, frankly, to have parents doing this and put them in this terrible position, um, you know, where they're going to be ripped from their school, probably. Look, so, is there any, but is there any, we don't have any, like, you know, internal connections with this family? We don't uh, have anything to We do, study? which is what led us to this problem, actually. <laughs> and, there's, there's and I can't discuss no anything further. No, no I don't want you. There's no way to do it, you know? You need some hard evidence when... when well, sometimes they'll stuff. admit it. If they come, you know, if you talk to the person, be like, hey, you know, I'm the caseworker on your case. I see you're going to that house right there. It's not in Highland Park. You know, you're going to have to remove your child. I'm going to report this to the superintendent. You know, the child really doesn't live here. The child lives somewhere else. I know, but sometimes they'll, sometimes it can be resolved without the need for... I'm wondering if there's a way to resolve it without the need for a private investigator. Yeah, somebody the who's, that were sent. Somebody who's <laughs> brazen <laughs> enough to do this is likely what? not to be moved <laughs> by, by a, a I know they do this. Appeal. All right. Yeah. Well, if there's nothing else you can do, I mean, my request would be that if there's anybody else who can reach out to them in the hope of arriving at some kind of non-adversarial... Can, but I, you've probably already done all that. Just, just bef before we move forward on anything like this, can you have the board attorney look one more time at 5111 and whether or not we can send them a letter uh, based on the way it's worded without having to employ a private investigator? You know, I, I know their recommendation right now is to use a private investigator, so we have enough there, but if there's any way that we could go, you know what, based on everything that we have and your failure to, uh, to comply with our two previous that's a great requests, idea. Yeah, that's uh, great. we're sending you, we, we feel that you're ineligible and you know, now you're on that 21 day clock per NJA 6A22 to respond to the board. That's I a great will, idea. I love that idea. That's fantastic. And if they don't, then we hire the PI. <laughs> Then we go to the I'm PI. sorry, Judy. And then if they don't respond to that, then what do you do? So you're no longer welcome here, or you get the PI. Oh yeah. I think that actually. I, I, I think I think if if they if if our bird attorney is able to do it based on our current policy, that would start the 20-day clock, and then the, those parents would have to appeal to I think us first by law and or to someone in Trenton. But, uh, but I think we're premature in starting a clock, and I think you actually would possibly um, limit your future options by starting a clock before you want to. And I think we're just case. fact yeah. finding. Because uh, looking at it, like, because this might be another question for the board attorney, like if we do start the clock, I don't know that it necessarily puts a monetary onus on the district or to the parent to show residency. Because if they're able to show residency, then we just go, okay, our bad. And we go, you know, we, we just continue forward and allow that student to continue with their out-of-district placement paid for under our dime. Well, but if they're unable to, then, then, we, then the, they would have to move forward on finding a different placement for that student. I, 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 don't, I don't think that's a good idea. I mean, I don't know what the attorney would say, but you, you put the family on notice and they quickly do whatever magic tricks they're going to do to get the kid to the a place that they say that the kid was supposed to live, which is their aunt, the aunt's house or the grandmother's house or whatever for a week or two or three. And they would send us pictures showing that the kid really lives there because they've been notified without 
us having in our hands the pictures of the kid not living there, the kid coming from Metuchen or Edison, which the PI didn't get a chance to, to make. So I think we ruin our own case. And we look pretty foolish. And that's, I think, why the, the, uh, the attorney made that suggestion. And I mean, this was common practice, and it was common practice 30 years ago. Common practice, yeah, but... Well, that may not be a great practice, but, but don't, put, no, don't put the onus on us, in. It's not on us. It's on them for doing this, for, you know, I'm going to say it again for, I hate to no, say No, I understand, I understand. Money. If they're doing this, they're stealing our money. The, the onus on us is to figure out how to deal with that, how to get them or how to confirm or deny. But it's not, they, it's not about whether they, like, we think it's a good idea for them to be stealing our money, you know, just to be clear. But, I don't want them to steal our money. But when, the, but, but when the investigator goes and says they really are living with, you know, with Aunt Harriet in, on, on whatever, you know, on North 6th, then we say, okay, and they don't even have to know it. Um, yeah. Right. But, it's, it's but not we're not just... tipping them off. You know, we're not, dealing, we're not dealing with good intentions here. So why tip someone off who doesn't have good intentions? Right. But I, it's I not agree. just where the student lives, because like, even if the student lives with their aunts in Highland Park, you know, that aunt is the person who provides all yeah, I... of the monetary income to for that student like they're supposed to not be getting any support or any other sort of input from the from the actual parents you know for that for that person you know when they Smart. when they supposedly domiciled there because if the parents are still providing support etc and they live out of district then it still falls under that stu that where those parents live who are providing the um, support services for the I think, the child. Really? I think we're making it a little too complicated. I, honestly, I think, I think we, we've, we're asking a simple question. Please return this letter. Please return this envelope. We're asking a few questions. Please return it. That's, we don't and have to get into it. We've asked multiple times. We don't have to worry about all, all of the other stuff. True. We then need, we need to verify the information at some point. Now, if we haven't gone far enough, with our standard tools, I don't think we need to create another right. sort of tool that, as Mark says, and I, I do think it would, uh, it would hurt our case later on if, if there were a case. I guess I'm tending to agree, yeah. I just hate it. I hate having a PI go out to someone's house or someone's non-house. <laughs> Probably because of the message that sends to our other students. You know, like. Well, you've given me my marching orders, so I know how to proceed. Okay, and we'll work on coming up with a policy that ensures yeah. that we, we yeah. do the same thing in every that. case. Um, and that's what we'll anticipate doing here with those other, other 49 families, God forbid. Hopefully some of them will get back to us. Don't worry, we're not gonna have you know, unmarked vans all over oh. the park <laughs> with, cat, with long zoom lenses. Right, again, we're talking about the most egregious cases, maybe one, two. And I think we can trust that the administration will do all that it can informally to reach out to people. For example, the administration knows that this person is living in Westfield. Maybe someone will go out to Westfield and be like, hey, do we have to hire a PI for you? Or maybe not. Maybe that would hurt our case. But if there is some reasonable way to deal with it. Okay. All right. Are we done with this discussion? Yep. Wow. Sorry, Scott. We really like worried that into it like a little. <laughs> you know, you put somewhere Darcy always says, our student reps are welcome to leave. Of course you are, but you're also welcome to stay. I don't want you to feel unwelcome because no one's welcomed you. <laughs> Whatever you would like. Um, Okay, so uh, let's see. We have board goals to do. It's 9.30 almost. Can I take a straw poll? Who feels like dealing with, dealing with board goals? Anybody feel like? I, I don't really feel like, I mean, I can tell you, I, I prepared a document that I shared with everybody, a couple of documents, right? One is Scott's, uh, it's a PDF of all the focus areas showing Scott's uh, status report with the red, yellow, blue, green, purple whatever the colors are, right? <laughs> um, and the other one is uh, sort of what I copied off of Scott's document. I put some notes on it. Um, I had a couple questions about some of the goals. Some of the goals, it seemed like we're putting them down again, but we already sort of accomplished some of them, so we want to make them more specific. Um, what I didn't do was sort of go through the strategic plan and look and see if there were things that were not on that list that I feel strongly about. Do people want to sort of do that over the next, before the next meeting? Sort of like really take a hard look at the strategic plan and their own preferences and determine if there are other goals that they really want to propose for our goals list. 
and also take a look at the suggested goals in that document. Those are Scott's suggestions with my markups. Yeah, I, I, uh, I plead guilty having uh, now looking at your comments for the first time. Well, you had yeah. an hour. I, it was I, an hour I, before. I, it was had, an hour I know before I had an hour. I, I, you did, and you should have stopped everything else. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I was a little behind. The dog needed walking. Of course, <laughs> the last couple of weeks but, of holidays have really put me. No, I didn't expect anybody to look at it an hour before the meeting. I, I mean, that's when I finally got to it, right? So, but can yeah. I say this is a great, this is a great start. Thank you. You're welcome. And no, I think it, it will be helpful to us to take a look at, at what you've done, and, and it'll give us probably some ideas to, um, you know, make some additional comments. I okay. would hope. Yeah. I mean, the, the document itself, the, the text of the, the, not the PDF, the Google Doc, um, those are the proposed goals that Scott put down. Um, and they're, for the most part, they're goals that were, I think, that, that you had already designated for 2017-18, or they're goals from this year that we hadn't finished. Correct. Right. Uh, and I did as we did last year. I just pulled out the ones we're emphasizing. A right. lot have to do with the first focus area on equity. Right. And then I modified some of the language to make it more relevant to the board's work, not right. so much the leadership team. Right, right. So I, mean, I think they look pretty good, a few questions, but I haven't had a chance to sort of go through the plan and, you know. So. And I don't think, I, I really don't think that any time uh, after 9.30, is a time to hash, or after 10 o'clock, is a time to hash out the, the fine points or the, even the large points of a board goals proposal. I, what, I, what, I'm, you know, what I'm thinking is that we should go over, the, as you just said, go over the goals before the next meeting and maybe pass a docu document among ourselves around so that we come up with something that we're pretty happy voting on, or very close to happy voting on. I like that idea, except for the quorum We just issue. have to be careful that right. we don't have quorum. So if people wanted to like, take the document, you know, copy it on their own piece of paper, okay. go through, make notes, and then maybe send it to me, or send it to Darcy, send it to somebody, you know, well in advance of the next meeting, mm -hmm. then one of us, uh, if you send it to me, I'll get it to Darcy. But, um, and then, then I can start putting the comments into a single document. We can pass it around. We're not voting on it. Can't we pass the document around between I, us? It's like have having a, a discussion. We That's can't like, have a live, dis I, I a live, oh, a live discussion on Google Doc or something? No, no, I wasn't, I wasn't suggesting a live discussion. I was suggesting a document that gets passed around that oh. people look at, like okay. we look at in the policies. So we can't do that via a Google Doc where people like make corrections to that or suggestions on that document. We cannot. But, no, because that would be like an email, That's That's an discussion. email chain yeah. involving all of us. I mean, actually, Mark, I think we can, but the, the position our board attorneys have taken is that we must be very careful to avoid even the slightest appearance oh, yeah. of violating. I mean, I think within the language of OPMA, we could certainly do it, but I... I am content to follow our attorney's recommendation. Okay. So, so, so the best way is then individually we look at the, at the list, we create new uh, comments and send them to Ann and Darcy. And then we can flush them out yeah. when we get together. I'll I'd compile them into a single them, document. I would be happy to send them to you to share with Darcy or to yeah, send them, Let's you. send them to me so we don't have a whole bunch okay. of piecemeal things. And okay, you, guys, Slavich, you, you got that? You're way down there. As a final point. Yeah, right. And then we'll assemble them into a final document Otherwise, that shows all the, all the comments. Every, every week it's going to be at 10 o'clock. It's 10 o'clock. It's the time of the morning. Okay. Well, we were originally going to get together and do a retreat to do the board goals I know. during the summer, and we just never did that. I know. We can't do it. Can we do it? We can't do it if we were going to do a public. A public, yeah. It could be public. It's going to be in, like, Westchester or whatever, but the public is welcome to attend. We could have three, t three separate tables at Pino's. <laughs> Don't we do that all the time anyway? <laughs> Just joking. Okay, so Ruslevich, is that okay with you? You're so far away down there. Ruslevich. Ruslevich. Yes. Is this a good plan for you? You feel you're so far away. I feel like I'm not necessarily including you in the conversation. I, I made con I made notes last week. I'm more than comfortable trying to like throw those at one or two other people just to feel them out and see where the, they are at with that and then come back to the table again uh, later on just let's like, come back to the virtual table if you if you have a chance Scott right. when is our next meeting I've forgotten the 13th November 13th. okay so I mean in the next week if you could go back to the oh that wait but it's, uh, it's only the okay in the next two weeks if you could go back to the virtual table yeah. you know take some notes on your own and then submit a document to me an email call me text me send me uh, something 
you know, Easily. a pictorial. Uh, <laughs> at the dog park. Yeah, at the dog park, we'll talk about it. Yeah, all right. Um, and board reps, we'd love to have your input. Um, so, you know, you, uh, you have my email address, presumably. You have all of our email addresses. So please, if the, you know, if there are things that you think we should be addressing as sort of central goals, then we need to hear about it. And I'm sorry, you'd like just, are the, board, the goals available for public oh. viewing or? Just as, I mean, just, and not even just for me, just as right. for the community as well. Yeah, well, at the end of every agenda, um, oh, I see. it's okay. printed up, yeah, a confusing list of, Got it. Okay. sort of our general goals and our more specific goals. I print at the end. So. Um, okay. When I send stuff to the board, though, to the board, board at HP schools, it doesn't go to you guys, right? Okay. Let me make sure I have your email addresses um, so I can share the goals document with you guys. Uh, go ahead. Uh, do you want to send them in public or do you want to not send them in public? I don't oh, care. Just my school. You just use our school, school, school addresses emails. for all okay. this kind of stuff. So. Okay, school Okay. So. Okay. So I will... Uh, email you guys the link to the board document goal that we're working with. Excellent, thank you. Okay, all right, very exciting. I mean, the, the goals are important because we really do have these goals that we want to express, but they also get very nitpicky, and are we gonna do action step A, 1.7, J, 2, 9, you know, so it can be a little annoying. Okay, although I do appreciate how Scott has organized it for us. All right, oh, sorry, so, um, <coughs> excuse me. So is there any new business besides whatever that we just discussed could be considered new? No new business? Okay, it's time for public comment. The Highland Park Board of Education welcomes public participation and is reserved this time for your comments. Board policies 164 and 167 establish and regulate the right of the public to participate in public meetings. Would anybody like to come to the podium and chat with us? <laughs> All right then. Um, then I think it's time for me to ask if there's a motion to adjourn. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, thanks. Good night, everybody. See you on the 13th.